So uh, thanks everyone for attending and, and for those of you watching the recording, which will be most people. And big thanks for this awesome panel of, of speakers that we put together. Uh, looking, really looking forward in the next hour to uh, essentially discuss the opportunities from investors' perspective uh, on this unique niche uh, under FinTech. We've got a really great panel uh, that's quite diverse and all brings different perspectives to this matter. Uh, so we expect by the end of this uh, uh, webinar, uh, really you'll come out with a lot of insight uh, and a, a lot of depth as well from, from this discussion. Uh, now, I'm very aware of the fragility of the attention span. So I, I feel like there's we're going to try and be very, very focused. I feel like there's a 15 minutes keep ahead uh, uh, button above my head every time I say something. So we are going to really try to, to get a lot of depth in this one hour while get those diverse opinions from the five speakers. So uh, the best way to achieve that is to cut the fluff to a minimum and as close to zero and really focus on what's uh, most important. Uh, so just to set the scene, I'm just going to cover a couple of quick things of what, what is actually the early adopters hub that we're organizing this uh, and then a little bit about what the agenda is. So just to briefly tell you what the early adopters hub is, is essentially it's easy to say what we're not. So the early adopters hub uh, is not a, a, an incubator, it's not a, an accelerator, and it's not a startup studio. Uh, it's something uh, new, essentially. We believe that founder vision is nice, uh, but it's not about that. It's not about what investors uh, think, uh, with all due respect to investors listening to this right now. At the end of the day, it's about the market and solving pain points and problems for the market. Uh, so that's what we do that we, that's unique. We bring that input as early as possible into the startup journey via a dedicated community of early adopter uh, accounting firms, which three of them are represented here today. Um, and that changes the formula uh, of essentially how to launch a new startup and tackle the biggest startup killer head on as early in the journey as possible that there is no market need. Sad realities, a lot of startups should never exist to begin with. Uh, that de risk the journey in a way never possible before makes startups a lot more capital efficient and at the end of the day brings a higher chance of success for early stage startups. So that's just very briefly about the early adopters hub. As far as the agenda for today, so obviously everyone wants to know about the future AI and all the hype and, 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 and how investors should approach that. We're going to touch a little bit on the past because if you do want to know where the industry is going and where the opportunities are as an investor, you need to understand a little bit uh, the past, we're not going to go 500 years back to where I think a double entry first came that, uh, you know, there's that Italian guy, all the currents admire, maybe just 10, 15 years back uh, and a little bit about the present. And then we're going to move to talk a bit more about the, the AI, you know, the hype versus the genuine opportunities for startups and investors in those startups. Uh, get a couple of perspective on that from Kendra uh, and from, from Sebastian, from Seb. Uh, we'll cover a little bit the risks and challenges and opportunities for investors in this space uh, and who are going to be uh, the winners. That's mostly what we're going to cover as far as the topic. Um, and, and essentially just to cover our ground as far as terminology to make sure we're all on the same page. What is accounting tech? <laughs> so quite often it just falls under uh, fintech, but essentially the way that we look at uh, fintech is any startup that's looking uh, at accounting tech, sorry, any startup that's looking to leverage all those changes that have happened in the industry for the last 10, 15 years, uh, where accountants are becoming not just a trusted advisor, but increasingly uh, an advisor around the, the tech stack uh, that flows out of the finance uh, uh, software. Um, and basically any startup that's leveraging those changes uh, and advances in industry to build a solution for either accountants as a user uh, or using accountants as a channel to the SME client, which uh, as a one-to-many channel, which essentially is zero, really build uh, the playbook for that. So those startups we feel fall under accounting tech. Uh, quite often they do something that's both for accountants as a user and for the SME uh, client. Uh, now, we obviously uh, have a hidden uh, and not hidden motive for putting this uh, uh, webinar together. Uh, if you finish this webinar and the one thing you come out of it, hopefully, is how do I get access as an investor to deal flow in accounting tech? Obviously, we offer you the solution uh, for that as well. So very briefly, 
Uh, we'll cover the detail of that in the end, but just to plant the seed right now, basically two ways. You can put your money into the Early Adopters Hub and get a portfolio built on your behalf uh, as we uh, de-risk those start vet them, de-risk them and increase the value or deal by deal, uh, basically join our investor network uh, and access those startups uh, if and when uh, they need their pre-seed and seed funding. Cool. So I lost track of time, but hopefully it was still okay. Uh, so we're going to move on and get started with basically just a quick round of intro so everybody knows all our speakers and why they've got that unique perspective uh, that we'll bring uh, in today. Uh, and then we'll start uh, with the specific questions. Uh, cool. So let's just do the quick intros, just a little bit about each speaker and a one sentence about what are they most excited about the future of accounting tech. Uh, Ali, if I let you go first, please. Ali Gara, All In Advisory. We're based in Radelaide, five years um, new, and um, I've got about 30 years in the game behind me in every size accounting firm you can imagine. Started my tech journey in 2010 and um, absolutely loving it, and I lean into that heavily, and we use a lot of that in our business. And I also am the co-host of all of the Accounting Adventures podcast as well, if you don't listen to that. Chicken on that. So that's me in a nutshell. And what are you most excited about the future of accounting tech? I think more efficiencies. Um, we're in a resourcing crisis, so I'm trying to work through how we can gain more efficiencies in the tech um, and gain more real-time data to allow more full um, advisory conversations. Thanks for that, Ali. Alistair? Just unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, cool. But uh, good morning, afternoon, or, or evening, depending where you are. My name is Alistair Barlow. I am uh, the founder and uh, CEO of a firm called Flinder, based here in London in the UK. We're one of the more progressive firms, and we build and run what we call smart finance functions for fast growth tech and e-commerce equity-backed businesses. So we do the full end-to-end -end finance function, which basically is the direction more and more businesses or more and more accounting firms are going to own the end-to-end uh, outsourced finance piece um, so that in itself brings challenges in and around technology available because it's quite a, a new trend in the in the kind of the grand scheme of things um, in addition to running Flinder we've also built some of our own technology around real-time reporting where we bring and mash financial and non-financial data together to give kind of much more depth and meaning to reporting and uh, kind of enhanced conversations on explaining to business owners not just what's happening but why it's happening um and in terms of accounting tech i think for me the potential is exciting but the reality is a little disappointing and i think that's because of the the trajectory we as a business at flinder are on and what we're asking for is ahead of what most technology companies are building for or are looking to so there's still huge growth potential, I think, in the technology space and, and applications or certainly reimagining that. And, you know, if, if Ali chooses efficiency as the kind of her go to uh, excitement, I'm going to choose insight. And what I mean by that is how can we like, ultimately, I think rightly there's a talent shortage. Maybe we'll go on some of that and why technology is so important, but we want to be as efficient as possible. But ultimately, the end goal is to deliver insight to clients and i think kind of you know everything we do on the journey in month end or year end or whatever whatever it is process that the accountant does ultimately we want to try and deliver insight so i'll go with insight is the uh, untapped frontier in accounting that needs to be solved ah, thanks for that alistair i think that sets us in quite well for your question later on jason Hey guys, uh, as Alistair said, morning, evening, afternoon, depending on where you are. I've just come from uh, London or Alistair's side of the world. So I think my body clock still thinks I'm in London, but I'm here in Melbourne, co-founder and director of a firm called Future Advisory. Um, that was very accidental and deliberate branding at the same time. We talk about the future. We talk about a world where we want our clients to have a better future. And we ultimately work with a lot of yeah, e-commerce, fast growth, tech companies. Um, you know, it's... It's a great space to be in. I think the firm's been around for three and a half years, but been in the industry for maybe close to 15. I've lost track. And, 
you know, never forget the day that a, a rep from zero came into the firm I was working at and said, make sure you buy zero shares. They're going to be, zero is going to be amazing. Um, I think the shares at the time were $9 a share and we sat there and, you know, we hadn't heard of zero. It was Recon and Myob and cash, flow, cash manager or whatever it was. So anyway, we we'll probably dive into a little bit of how fast some of these things move and how, what happens in the space of 10 years and where we are today and what some of the technology we're looking at now is going to look like in, in that time. Uh, the hat's being worn. Ali, uh, love the mention of the podcast. Also a co-host of a podcast called The Numbers Game. Um, so if you haven't listened to that, go and check that out. It's uh, We're having a lot of fun there. And then also, fortunately, in the time that I've been part of the uh, early adopters hub, as well as you know having great conversations with my clients, I've had the uh, fortunate events of being able to invest in quite a few startups um, and a couple in the accounting space that have doing some amazing things. So I'm here more to throw in a little bit of the info around what it's like to be an investor, but also how I'm excited for what Early Adopters Hub is going to be able to do to streamline that for accountants. When it comes to the one line of the future of accounting tech, um, automating those processes that we don't want to do, that that gets me excited. Okay, I don't want too much for now. Um, and then the reason for automating those complex processes that gets me excited is, as Alistair said, the financial insights we can gain from that. You know, I want quick access to data I can trust so I can have meaningful human conversations with our clients. Thanks for that, Jason. Uh, Kendra? Hello, thank you so much for having me. And yes, anybody I was wondering, I do have a very needy cat sitting in my lap, which is why I keep seeing ears and tails coming on and off the screen there. It's that time of the day and she needs a cuddle. Um, I most recently was the uh, global lead for data and AI products at Zero, and during I was there for four and a half years and we launched seven AI products into market. So now in use by the three million odd users around the world, which was an absolutely fantastic ride. Zero is and was an absolutely fantastic company to work for. I'm currently on a bit of a sabbatical, diving deep into how um, some of the emerging techniques in AI can be applied in commercial operations. And then I spend a bit of my time on the side advising boards and founders and startups on sort of I would describe it as the art of the possible because I think we are seeing a lot of the art of the improbable at the moment and sort of the fine line of how you make money using the emerging technology is, is one where you can you can cut a lot of fluff as Anton was saying at the beginning, Johan was saying at the beginning of the chat. Um, my, I don't host, host a podcast, but I do write a Substack. For the, so for those of you who prefer to get your information in writing than in in, uh, in audio form, I uh, host the Substack Data Runs Deep, and you can check that one out. What I am deeply, deeply keen to see in in AI and accounting tech over the next 10 years is really bringing to life the vision that machines and humans can work in synergy. There is an enormous amount of fairly rote manual work still in being a bookkeeper and an accountant. And that is a fantastic place to apply the new and current and emerging techniques in AI. And I think we can we can help both get over the labor shortage that we've all been talking about for years and make the lives of the people who work in and around the small business economy more enjoyable because they can focus on the things that they find more fun to do. I do think there's a bit of a hurdle in our way because we have to make sure that we use machines and humans synergistically and there are ways to develop the tech the tech that actually end up with humans doing less enjoyable jobs so i think we have a little bit of a, an ocean to steer through there thank you kendra great intro seb just to finish off yeah like how do i follow up from all these amazing speakers so far uh, hi i'm sebastian i uh by way of background i started off as a, a game developer um i really liked fps's and rts's and all this stuff so i wanted to build games i went into finance um i worked at wise uh one of the things i worked on was the wise zero integration for example and some things like that then i went to jp morgan um so i i basically i feel like a fish in water when it comes to finance I left JP Morgan. I wanted to start uh, a startup. I, I saw too many Excel spreadsheets while I was in there, and I thought the world needs less of them. But uh, I, I failed my startup basically after two years of spending lots of time and money on it uh, because we didn't find product market fit. Uh, I learned my lessons and uh, I basically caught the early days of AI when I was unemployed. So I got a lot of time to think around with it. So I'm here to basically ride the, the full wave again. But this time, I'm actually excited about what's possible with the tech. We'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later. 
Um, now to add something, I like I agree with efficiency. I agree with insight. I agree with like every, everything that everyone else said. I'm trying to think of what to add that maybe other people haven't mentioned. From my side, I'm excited about the fact that the traditional borders around accounting are coming down and you'll be able to do accounting related tasks from other apps um, and kind of like, you know, like affect the data that goes into traditional accounting from other sources, but also use this later on in other parts of the business, like when you're delivering insights versus just looking at inventory for a traditional e-commerce business or stuff like that. So yeah, excited to be here. Thanks for that, Seb. Cool. That uh, finishes our round of introductions. Well, it took us a little bit longer, but I think everybody actually already said the scene quite well uh, for the discussion we're going to have now. So I'm going to go and, and start the first question. Uh, I will actually add a challenge to all the speakers that I didn't prep you for. Uh, I'm quite confident an AI can probably write a, a webinar about AI and, it's, and, and host it as well. So I'll challenge all the speakers to bring some really creative insight that uh, nobody's going to think an AI came out with that insight. Uh, cool. With that challenge, uh, Ali, I'll pass it over to you basically uh, to start off your accountant hat, not necessarily the investor hat uh, that represents the market. Uh, and tell us a little bit about what, what happened in the last 10, 15 years. What was the impact for you uh, as a firm um, and, and where you are now? Well, the way that you can tell that it's not AI written is I'll tell it through story. So um, I was at a big four um, Deloitte at the time when about 10, 15 years ago, and um, I stumbled across uh, Zero. I, they came and did a presentation, and that's really when, for me, the game changed in relation to accounting technology, and it started my journey through cloud. Um, and eventually has taken me to my own firm. Um, we are fully cloud-based, um, automated and integrated. So I think it was a huge career shift um, for me because I've always was on the compliance and on the tools, but I really loved advisory. And so the cloud game changer was having that access to client data instead of getting the myob back up six to 12 months later. You actually had you, were, you had that one client shared ledger, and so that was such a game changer for me. And so then it actually allowed me to lean a lot more into the advisory space with that real time data, giving really, I guess, more valuable insights to my clients. And zero being the platform, I really lent into what else is around, and really learned the ecosystem. And I truly don't think that I would own my own firm today if it wasn't for the cloud, because I work part-time. Um, I do, you know, mum school hours and I don't work on Fridays. So I needed cloud to give me the functionality, the accessibility, the flexibility that I can then obviously provide to my team members as well. And that's why I get some really great quality team members because of all of the things that that provides. But there's, there was also a layer of cost efficiency that I didn't need to purchase servers and have huge volumes of space for files and storage. So the cloud and all of the technology and all of the emerging technologies over the last 10 to 15 years really set up my trajectory in advisory and also for me to start up my own firm and, and work in ways that I can then have the flexibility of being a mum and a business owner. So massively, massively impacted my life. Thanks for that, Ali. Uh, Alice, over to you. Again, if you want to add anything to Ali uh, for a little bit, feel free. But I guess from your perspective, uh, putting your accounting firm hat, uh, you know, like everything Ali has mentioned has taken the industry forward quite a lot, created a lot of opportunities for, for the tech vendors that enable that. But from your perspective, what are the frustrations and blockers that you still feel uh, in your firm that the cloud revolution hasn't necessarily delivered on yet? Yeah, so I think, I think first of all, like I, I beat the technology vendors up a little bit and say, hey, we've got these gaps. Um, we're not good enough here. We're not good enough there. Um, and I think rightly so, because we're trying to move forward. But, you know, on, on reflection, we kind of if you if you look back a little bit, hey, we were 20 years ago, we were on pen, paper and some spreadsheets. Right. So actually, you know, it, it, we've got to look at it and go, oh, well, actually, we've moved along you know, pretty well, pretty quickly, you know, we've got most of our apps, well, all the apps we certainly use are all cloud native applications. 
Um, you know, so so the the world has moved on quite well. But actually, if you put it in balance with life and how life technology's moved on, that's probably what we're comparing it to and going, actually, I still have I still have broken processes. I still have gaps between one application and another and another. And so I kind of put it in the perspective of that. Um a lot. So I'm not from small accounting background. I, I was 15, 16 years at PwC, worked on large multinationals, so didn't have this kind of, you know, this, um, you know, what happens in a small accounting firm for small businesses. And so a lot of people come from the perspective of this is how it was. I come from perspective of this is how it, this is how it could be and how it should be. And so a, a general disappointment on te- of technology where you've got one bit of technology doing a tiny little bit, Another application doing something complete, uh, sorry, doing something as well. Another part of the the process, and in between, there's this like chasm. None of the applicate or very few of the applications talk to each other and have like a harmonized, um, a harmonized roadmap, a harmonized plan. You know, some sort of consortium where they're actually working together. And I look at my team's timesheets. I look at the team in the office when they when they pull out revenue from one system and have to figure out like rev rec, um, you know, and, and calculate revenue recognition, then post it into the general ledger because, you know, it doesn't go seamlessly from one system to another. And I'm like, I, I'm just thinking, what, why? Why in this day and age does that need to happen? Do we still plug the gaps with Microsoft Excel or, or Google Sheets? But it's the sad fact of it, right? When you look at what powers finance, you look at people, processes, technology and more and more data right and actually so it, we're in a really exciting space that accounting is more about data it's more about interpretation more about storytelling to what ali said before it's more around those analysts and the conversations than w- what it used to be about and that data is just it's it's in one system it's another system and and if you look at those four different areas people process technology and data the technology isn't following a process the whole way or it's not talking seamlessly to another piece of technology and those break points are just where as an accounting firm owner we see leakage and we see in terms of like time and we see just waste and inefficiency so for me like it comes back to what Alex said at the beginning she's looking for efficiency in in her you know as, as kind of the next wave and something really to be excited about we absolutely need it so we can release all this human time that we're wasting in plugging gaps so that they can have better conversations and actually advise clients. And so, you know, we might have the same people, but let's shift them from this waste, this inefficient use of time to something more value adding. And technology should be able to do that, but it's they're, they're too often in isolation and just plugging one tiny little gap. That's that's kind of you know some of the blockers. I think um, you can feel that you can feel my pain coming out now, right? Um, but yeah, maybe I'll pause there, Johan, and uh, hand it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Alistair. I think your pain is coming through the recovery of COVID as well, which is impressive. Uh, Jason, uh, all over to you. See, so, yeah, if you do want to address anything like with your accountant had that Ali and Alistair said, feel free. But I, I guess for to move on the conversation uh, after that, from your perspective, uh, more as an investor, so what what kind of opportunities uh, have been created from this whole transition to the cloud, which uh, again has really been pioneered by by zero, and 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 to set this in a little bit for Canada afterwards, like where do you see the opportunities of the investor moving forward? Yeah, great. Um, look, I think just following on with the storytelling side of things, I remember it doesn't feel like that long ago in my early to mid twenties, which is 10, 12 years ago. Um, you know, my job started with printed out bank statements, a ruler and a pen farmers that would drop off shoe boxes full of, you know, receipts, papers, there's some manure spread across it. I worked in a, re- a rural kind of area and I sat there with a ruler having to go bank line item by line item, entering into cash flow manager with the opening balance from the previous time we'd done their bass or their month. And and it was a manual, tedious, bit by bit process. And that doesn't feel like that long ago. And now the team members that I'm hiring today, I tell them that story. They're like, what do you mean they brought in a, a shopping bag full of receipts and you had a ruler and a pen? Like, I looked around the office and couldn't even see a pen on the desk. So again, kind of setting the scene of, you know, that cloud and zero journey of 10 to 15 years on, you know, 
well, this has become the norm. It's become the norm that we open our phone and type something in. There's actually AI sitting behind it trying to sort something out for me. Like Ask Meta popped up out of nowhere the other day. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to ask Meta. I just wanted to look up somebody's Instagram page. So yeah, in accounting land as well, to center back to that, you know, even, you know, hearing from Alistair, you know, the, the, the blockers and the frustrations are there. There's just so many different systems that don't talk to each other, but they're all trying to help us to do something in that world. When we get to a point where it can all be integrated and talk to each other, that's pretty exciting kind of future point. If we get there and when we get there on the exciting side of investing in, you know, this new age of where cloud has come into it. The exciting part is, I think Ali mentioned it, like CD-ROMs that used to be sent around or floppy disks. You know, we don't have that anymore. The scalability of a cloud software or cloud program just makes this super exciting. You've got recurring revenue model as well. I remember, you know, a client cracking the shits about paying a couple of hundred dollars for their my old disk and then they had to pay for the updates and then whatever else would happen. And now you've got like a neat monthly amount and yes, zero puts their price up or puts their price up, but people are pretty sticky. If the software is doing a good job and saving time, they're going to stay. While we do have frustrations with the integration capabilities, it's still, there's still a lot of things that talk to each other that are making our lives a lot better today than what they were when I had a ruler and a pen and a shoebox full of crap. So the the automation, the AI, I know that I think part of the frustration is when AI was launched or chat GPT came out in November, 2023, and everyone went, holy crap, it's here. Like, this is going to be awesome. And then it kind of fizzled out a little bit because it, it didn't really seem like there was enough of this amazing AI, you know, magic that we expected to see. So I know it's coming. I know there's plenty of people out there like Sebastian that are, you know, so excited about the AI things that are capable and, and we're just biding our time to be able to see it. But that's why the investment into this area becomes so, so exciting and such an opportunity. And the people that are trying to understand it or want to be part of it and want to get involved are people who I truly believe are going to reap the benefits from it. And again, I think back to to younger Jace who got told to buy zero shares when they were $9 a pop. And I'm looking at, you know, when it got to its highest at $150, a, you know, I called my business partner, Greg, and went, man, do you remember that day? He goes, shut up. I don't want to talk about it. So, you know, so I sit here going, if we can drag other other accounting firm owners and people in our industry along with us when we're going to, you know, be part of this next wave of investing in accounting tech, that gets me excited. And I want to be, you know, on that journey, especially with like-minded people that are having a crack. It's kind of why I'm here today. And I hope I somehow went around in a circle, might not have answered the question, but, you know, pretty excited by what we're talking about. No, thanks. And not having a shoebox full of crap anymore. So. <laughs> no, thanks for that. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing from your store, you definitely bought lots of shares of zero. I think you can get it a hold on. Um, well, the, the, the good time was when, uh, you know, the only good part of COVID I could say is when the shares went down to about 60 or $70 um, Aussie a share for, for the Aussies listening. Um, that was probably the best part of COVID. And when my wife messaged me saying, what happened to all the money that was in the bank account? I forgot to tell her that I was uh, transferring it into the stock market. So got in trouble that day. But yes, sorry, Johan. Uh, no, that, that, I think it's a good uh, anecdotal story to add. Uh, cool. Th thanks for that. Uh, um, Ali Alistair and Jason, I think you said the scene very well to kind of move the conversation and more and more about the future and the opportunities. So Kendra, mo moving on, kind of passing on with you, you've, you've really got the, the expertise and, and prestige uh, in your in your resume when it comes to AI. And I think at the end of the day, it's no secret. There's, there's a lot of hype when it comes to AI. Like Jason said, some of it is fizzled out, but it's still a very hot uh, market for in uh, investors in startups when it comes to AI and um, and you know more consciously less consciously a lot of of, of people vendors uh, companies are taking advantage of that you know from big providers they just want to tick the box for shareholders that they're doing something with AI uh, to like you know new startups coming to the market that are basically just trying to raise as much money as possible uh, uh, with the AI hype wave so Kendra, what, what do you think, how can investors really tell the difference between a startup that's generally, genuinely trying to, to leverage AI to do something transformative that could end up as, as, as a huge upside long term and those that are just trying to kind of like ride that hype? Yeah, it's a really good question. And um, Jason, if you're nostalgic for that shoebox, mate, uh, head over to Canada when um, you would be astonished how much of their accounting is still paper based. Um, it was quite eye-opening for me when I took a trip over there and was talking to some of the sales team back when I worked at Zero. Um, 
Thank you for constraining it just a little bit, Johan, to start up. I think it's really different across the, the value chain and the different size of companies. Um, maybe I'd start with pointing out that part of the reason why it feels like there has been so much hype and so much of it has fizzled, which I completely agree is the way it feels, is that ChatGPT, when it launched in what was it, 18 months ago now, it was the culmination of about 15 years of research. So OpenAI cracked the ability to suddenly make it mass market, but they actually did very little of the research that the stuff was based on. They did heaps, not taking anything away from them. They did some amazing stuff, but they stood on the shoulders of giants when they did it, which Google is happily to remind us whenever they possibly can. But I think that's why one reason why it feels like it's fizzled, because it feels like to most folk that that amazing thing that we all discovered in November 2022 was something they just cooked up over a you know, couple of years and popped out into the world, and of course it wasn't. And so there was no way we were ever going to be able to keep making things look as extraordinary as fast because we released to the world such an incredible amount of work. Um, so that's, I just think, a good thing to baseline yourself on when you're like, oh, was there any, anything real here or was, was it all just sort of smoke and mirrors and the Wizard of Oz? Um, when, I, when I'm talking to startups, which does happen quite a lot, um, and when I'm talking to folk who are thinking about investing in them, it's, it's not that hard to tell the difference between somebody who has put AI onto their product or, you know, heaven forbid, their, their domain name because it's sexy and those who've actually got something to solve. And I saw a good friend of mine, Xero, said on LinkedIn the other day, um, I think we've hit the point where you should take AI off your product name now because it's kind of like it's almost it's almost an anti-pattern. I would always be careful and I would talk to founders and say, any founder who tells you that the data doesn't matter because they have AI, massive red flag. The data will always matter. And the moment they say that, you know that they are someone who is sprinkling the thing on top and doesn't actually understand how sustainable value is built. Um, I would, if you're an investor and kicking the tires, I would ask them for their cost model. AI, generative AI specifically, because it's a very specific thing, is super cheap to play with because the economics are set up that way. And the big cloud giants are really good at giving people free credits to play but it becomes a super costly solution if you run it at scale. If your startup has a cost model and understands how they expect to make money with it, that's a really positive sign because it means that they really have thought hard enough about what they're building that they're trying to figure out how they'll make money out of it into the medium term. Classically, always, I would ask them, what's to stop OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, or Amazon turning around and creating your business when they get bored? There are lots of good answers to that question, but if the people don't have an answer to the question, that's a really worrying one for me. And I think the last one would be something that's been true for time immemorial with anything that has machine learning or AI attached to it. Ask them, oh, sorry, I've got one more very important one, but this one, ask them whether they need, whether their AI will always be correct. It won't, spoiler alert, and how their workflows support the fact that any AI is, is going to make, it's going to fail some of the time and therefore they need to have a workflow, a way of taking the humans through the process that is robust and resilient to the fact that whatever model they have in the background will fail some of the time. Humans fail some of the time. I'm not saying AI is not wonderful, it absolutely is, but we're used to humans failing and we feel okay about it. We're kind of grumpy and uncomfortable when computers fail on us. And so any computer process, any internet-based process that has an AI built into it, it's going to be a bit of a new experience for a lot of us as humans because we're not used to machines making mistakes. So AI-based startups need to understand that the AI will make mistakes and build into their workflow in a graceful way the fact that it will fail. And then the last one, and this is a super easy one, have a look at the technical co-founder. If they don't have one, massive red flag. If they have one who's last five jobs have not been somewhere in and around data and AI, reasonable red flag. It's not the same as simply working in an application software. You need really strong application software developers in your workforce. But if you don't have a technical co-founder who actually has a background in this space, you are going to be pushing shit uphill from the very beginning. So I would be super, super cautious. All right. Thanks for that, Kendra. I think that's really very, very useful and practical insight there from your uh, expertise. Uh, Seb, moving on uh, to you, 
Um, so yeah, so you've kind of been deeply involved building tech in, in, in this space now for a few years. Um, and essentially really at the moment, uh, going deep, kind of like working on something new uh, to solve uh, pain points and problems for accountants and their clients. And, and you really get into the nitty gritty, a, a practical detail of, of the latest AI. So from your perspective, what, what are you seeing that potentially wasn't quite possible before with this latest uh, wave of AI innovation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me let me put some 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 guardrails on that so that we know what we're talking about on one side i remember when gpt2 came out and it was just like a shoddy web page and you could type some text in and like just play around with it um it was a uh, kind of like mind blowing to see that you could have a computer like narrate something for you create a story and so on and so i think that got a little bit carried forward when gpt3 3.5 4 came out people were still using it for generative stuff i am just going to put a guardrail on that i'm going to like kind of put aside the possibility of using ai today to meaningfully create efficient communication clean communication clear stuff from my experience it's very easy to fall into if you add that to your product it's very easy to create slop like uh, you'll create a mess or like a wall of text that will not actually be relevant or something like that and we're seeing it today with some of the products like even gemini is like how to get to the products and sometimes fails and so on um on the other side, I'm really excited about the frontier of using agentic software. So like delegating an AI to have the power to act in the real world, even if that's online, on your behalf with a script or with a mixture of agents or pre-trained like teams and so on uh, to achieve a goal that you don't explicitly code for or build the product for. Like, so somewhere in between these two, I'm gonna like mention a couple of practical things that I've seen that I think that current generation of models and techniques that we have to use them are really powerful for. Uh, on one side, I'm really excited about anything that has transformation tasks. So you have this spreadsheet in this format, and now you want this spreadsheet in another format, those kinds of like input output tasks where part of your process is taking data from one system and putting it in another, but you just need like a slightly different format. Uh, from what I've seen, like Pretty solid. Like, of course, keep in mind, like workflows can fail and you need to account for that and all the stuff can be really like touched on. But in my opinion, what I've seen is that uh, even three GPT-3 was already excellent at taking some data in one format and then outputting in another. So practical case for that would be like, oh, I've got this a statement from a client and I need to enter a bunch of transactions in one go or something like that, where you want to include it as part of your product. Super easy to do. It seems reliable, like no problems with that. Another thing that I've seen is that if you combine it, if you use some kind of a multimodal AI or something like that, like that's that's more cutting edge, you can actually get some pretty crazy tasks where you can feed it a report or you can feed it a photo of an invoice or a photo of a statement or something like that. And it can read all of this data for you and uh, saves you a lot in terms of having to pipe up different tools together to get the same result on the other side. So that's more for the application developers, for the startup builders like, um, seems like uh, the models that we have these days are, are pretty good at that. Um, now, on a, I guess as a last thing that I would add here as a practical use case, I'm particularly excited about any task that has large corpus of text that needs to be summarized and you need to extract some insights. Um, I, I found that uh, there's a lot of products out there that try to do this for specific domains. There's some that try to do it for, I don't know, like medical research, like generate me some kind of like report of all the research that was done in this area. Um, you're getting mixed results, but I think if you manage to really understand the, the case that you're going for, like you need to retrieve some legal text about, I don't know, like selling abroad or something like that. So you can incorporate it into your product. Um, I think AI yeah, is like really good at that today. And like, I would recommend, like don't take it out of the box and just use it. Of course, like you, you actually do need an engineer on the team and you need some people who can tweak it and deploy it into production safely and all of this, but pretty exciting stuff that's coming out from that. And at the frontier, um, just mentioning it, but I think the era of co-pilot style apps that we're seeing today is probably going to fizzle out in a little bit of time. Um, I think it's uh, like speaking of that final frontier of like, hey, we have agents on our that do the work on our behalf and we don't have too much to to do. Um, I'm I'm really excited about people who can write playbooks for, for an agent or 
They can describe the task that they want to get done in kind of like their own words and then delegate it to a team of, of agents who can run that task on their behalf. So to make it less abstract, maybe uh, something that could work there is, for example, you need a very like clever reconciliation or you need something that involves multiple steps. The way in which I'm seeing product philosophy done today is that you would have a co-pilot that sits by your side and you would just type these commands almost like a, a modern day, like, a, I don't know, user of a terminal or something. You would just ask the AI to do stuff. I'm excited about the future where you don't need to do that. You just open up the product and that works already done for you. And you're just presented with like two, three options to pick for and like to pick from and you go from there. So maybe uh, to summarize, like uh, anything to do with uh, summarization, data transformation today, uh, if you have any type of task that involves uh, multiple uh, types of inputs, so not just text, but you could do image, you could do audio, you could do other stuff. Pretty exciting stuff that's coming up from there. And at the frontier, I really look for people who can understand the processes that are going on in anywhere in the space of accounting tech and really can understand how agents and agentic workflows are built and can incorporate those. So just my two cents, other people may disagree with this, but that's kind of where I stand on like the, the most exciting areas. Thanks for that, Seb. Really appreciate it. I think we've uh, taken a, you know, a bit of a journey with everyone. Uh, and now kind of like to finish off last couple of uh, questions uh, to get everyone's uh, input. Uh, Ali, I might still we might still still start with you, uh, but then all the others kind of like jump in uh, if and how they they want. So kind of like bringing it all together. What what do you think from your perspective are the risks, challenges, and and opportunities of uh, uh, for investors basically in accounting uh, tech that they need to consider to succeed? Yeah, and I think this comes back to actually understanding the industry and the market. Um, so, you know, not building a piece of tech and thinking that you'll be able to slot it in. You actually need to understand the nuances and the pain points that Alistair was talking about before. But there are still so many gaps and there are still so many pain points, but it's actually making sure that you're finding the right ones that fit in the right spots for the majority because um, you might be, you know, in a bubble <laughs> of like-minded and there's, there's a plethora of um, accountants out there, traditional and progressive, and it kind of, you know, needs to cross the divide um, and a big enough pain point to actually scale and make money from. I think that's, I guess, one of the challenges if, you know, you want to build a really successful piece of tech, you've actually got to resolve a pain point. And obviously the, the speed of their technology, making sure that, um, I guess, they're future-proofing it as best as they can so that it's not a piece of software that might work for a couple of years and then, you know, it's superseded by another one. Um, so really making sure that it can grow um, and continue to future-proof itself. Those would be the major ones that I can see at this point. Thanks, Ali. Uh, anyone else who wants to jump in? I would be watching how regulation, <clears throat> regulation of both accounting and AI is moving. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more movement towards countries doing things like Singapore has done in terms of electronic invoicing and that's going to change significantly who can find data and who can get clean sources of data which is a really big issue when you are building AI and I'd also be looking super carefully at regulation of AI in different countries and different jurisdictions particularly if you are an Australian or New Zealand based startup with aspirations to launch into the UK and the US which many Australian and Kiwi startups do have. That's their growth plan. But that is a regulatory challenge that is possibly heading towards becoming a regulatory nightmare as we see the US and the UK and EU actually move further apart in the way that, in the places that they are comfortable in AI being brought into workflows rather than moving closer together. And I think it's a mistake that folk often make when they come from outside the accounting industry is they see accounting as unregulated whereas I would always prefer to regard it as regulatory adjacent um, and actually relatively heavily regulated, even though it doesn't have a specific regulator. So I think that's an, an easy place for people to trip up if they haven't worked in around the industry for a while. I think, oh, sorry, Seb, go for it. I'll just add something super quick. Be careful of building on top of uh, closed, uh, closed source models like... Uh, building your whole business on top of open AI and not having any kind of plan of like, okay, what happens if another company launches something that's even cooler? That's more for the builders out there than the investors. Like 
maybe as an investor you just want to ask like hey what's your plan like around privacy of data like like how do you make sure that open ai is not just going to like suck up all of your like mistakes basically and come up with a better model and like use that so pay attention to open source stuff yeah that's that's pretty much it for my side i think um I think accountants are becoming a bit savvier when it comes to the technology they're using in terms of not, not just what's the technology, not just what's the technology do, does it fit the problem that I have, but the company and the founders, what's the longevity of them? And so accountants are asking smarter questions because they see, so, so change is a, is a big thing, right? For any accounting firm, because you've got to change Bit of technology, so you people need to get trained up, and you've got to go through a bunch of assessments, you know, uh, around GDPR or in the UK GDPR and such like. And so once you finally got it in onboarded, people using it, maybe your clients need a bit of change management as well. And then we've seen a lot of accounting technology companies that actually don't continue after two to three years. They don't get follow-on funding, and so accountants are asking more questions around the company, not just the product. And so I think that's. Um, well, it's a risk, a challenge, and an opportunity all in one. I, I I see everything that's a challenge is also an opportunity as well. So I think uh, the, the other key one is like lack of market knowledge from the founders. There's quite a lot of, I see and speak to quite a lot of accounting tech founders that don't really understand, well, maybe it's fair not to understand what accountants do, but don't understand what we do as a firm. And more and more firms are moving towards an outsourced model and therefore, they should know these, these macro trends and they should be able to understand what we do, but they don't really, the product doesn't hit the sweet spot. They're, they're, they're missing that product market fit. So that's a huge, huge challenge, I think, for founders. But again, it's a great opportunity for those that do get it right. Um, so that's that's huge. I think, just go back to this kind of agent concept that Seb was talking about. Um, I see... If we have junior, if we have junior people coming into the business, right? That's typically how an accounting model works. You have, you have junior people; they come in, they get trained up, they get qualified, they become managers, they train other people, etc. Right? That's kind of how well, that's how life works, but that's how accounting firms work as well. Um, and a, a trainee accountant on day one has has you know largely no knowledge about accounting, and they come in. And you say to them, right, this is a this is a journal entry. This is like how you do prepayments. This is how you do a bank rec. And we give them very small steps, like one, two, three, four, five. These are what you have to do. And it's if you take a step back, you know, a lot of people go, oh, how can AI replace this? Or how can technology replace this? Actually, they're very bite sizable chunks um, that, that we teach somebody so that they can understand it and understand it well. And I think those steps, those series of steps, if we're coaching a, a, someone that's got no experience on, a, on, a, on accounting to do it, then actually it's not that complicated. It's just building blocks. And I think that's a huge opportunity for us to streamline and take that step and go, do you know what? We don't, it doesn't have to be a human that does it. It can be technology. So I think that's huge opportunity. Um, and the last one I'll throw out is that in every single bit of technology that we use within our business and that I see on the market, there's areas for improvement. Um, so that, that's a huge opportunity as well. There's just, there's just huge huge opportunities for improvement out there. Thanks for that, Alistair. I, I will add a small comment though, that quite often startups on the outside, like, oh, there's a 10% uh, opportunity for improvement, but it kind of is not gonna move systems and retrain everyone, especially if it's client facing for a five, 10% uh, improvement. I think some, some uh, startups uh, ignore that a little bit. Uh, Jason, did you wanna add anything from your perspective? Yeah, I was going to say, like from a risk or risk challenge opportunity, whatever it lands in, accountants are, are set in their way in a certain um, sense. I know the people we all surround ourselves with, the people that are in this room anyway, we're probably think of accountants in a certain way, but the vast majority of our industry is a little bit antiquated. There's still people out there that aren't using the systems that we're using. There's ones that still see zero as something that might disappear soon because it's not all it's cracked up to be. And, you know, there's still desktop servers out there that are, you know, being replaced every few years for six figures. So the challenge as well with the accounting tech founders that, you know, especially some of the ones that we see is they think the market's a lot bigger than what it is. They get the Ibis World Research or whatever it is that says how many accounting firms there are for them to sell their software to. 
but not all of those accounting firms are going to be buyers, not especially in the short term anyway. So it's understanding the numbers, how many you're actually going to convert. And then even, you know, I've seen, you know, quite a lot of pretty cool tech that's come out recently where it is solving a problem, but it's almost like it's come too soon because we're still too focused on compliance and smashing out the tax returns and the basses and the payroll taxes and all the other compliance things that we still have to do because we haven't actually been able to automate all that stuff efficiently and make it an efficient process. We can't get to the really cool AI stuff that's telling us the financial insights of the conversations we should have with our clients. Not all firms are now currently structured or set up to do that. So the challenge is, and the risk and the opportunity there is some people, the, the vast majority of the, the industry that we're trying to sell some cool tech to maybe aren't ready just yet for it. So there'll be a bit of a lag factor. All right. Thanks for that, Jason. Um, I think we'll, we'll start to kind of like wrap up a little bit. Uh, I, I will say to the people that are on the attending live, if you do actually have any questions that, whatever reason we still haven't covered and you want to ask the panel quickly, then feel free to put that in the chat. Uh, and don't promise we'll see how we are for time, but we might uh, try and address that quickly. Uh, I, I, just to kind of like wrap up um, and then we'll just cover maybe a final topic with, uh, with everyone. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll finish this quickly as far as our incentive uh, for doing this webinar. Uh, if you've listened to all this and you're more curious about how you can get access to deal flow as an investor uh, in the accounting tech space, which hopefully you can see there are a lot of exciting opportunities, a lot of challenges and risks, but definitely a lot of opportunities for those that are going to succeed, like those that have uh, in the past from the last uh, cloud revolution. Uh, so the two options, as I mentioned, just to give you a bit more detail. So uh, into the early dollar sub for our current raise, that's a more of a limited time offer as we're currently uh, doing this race to deploy over the next two years. So opportunity after that might only be in a couple of years. Uh, essentially, we're not going to, we're raising into the early sub not to put money into startups, uh, but it's going to fund operations. And with that, we're going to do what we do best and get sweat equity uh, early in the startup journey when cash investors don't have access and everything that we do for the amazing uh, accountants that are here as well, uh, de-risk and validate those startups to make sure they're building products that actually solve pain points and problems and have the potential. Um, on behalf of uh, investors, we're essentially going to build a portfolio at 5 to 10% uh, equity stake. Uh, that's our target in each startup. Uh, aim for 15 to 20 startups uh, to take part uh, in this portfolio. We already have three startups, so we do have some equity in already. Uh, very briefly, our investment thesis, uh, we're going to be optimizing for the success of each startup going into our portfolio, not just trying to uh, pressure everyone to become a unicorn. So we're kind of pu putting it as a power law plus. We're still happy with unicorns if we get them, uh, but we do want to help each startup to succeed. And the important way we're going to do that is basically use these amazing accounts to validate or invalidate any idea uh, before it actually uh, goes into our portfolio. Uh, we're, we're not a VC fund, to be clear. It's going to be done through a dedicated SPV that's going to be holding the uh, equity advantages uh, for your investor, diversified, lower risk via uh, portfolio, lower time commitment uh, with, with us doing all the heavy lifting, uh, gives you exposure to this uh, uh, niche, uh, and obviously managed by the earlier Dower sub that we've got the amazing 80 accounting firms from around the world that take part uh, and the team uh, behind it as well, including myself. I've been doing it for the last four years. Uh, second option, if you want access to deal flow uh, that we can help with. So that's basically deal by deal. As our startups get validated and get de-risked, uh, they're going to need to raise pre-seed and seed. So you can join our network uh, to get access if and when uh, that happens. For now, uh, we're not going to charge anything uh, for having access to that deal flow uh, deal by deal uh, as we build a relationship and prove the value of what we do. Uh, both those cases, uh, you get access to highly vetted and de-risked uh, startups with a higher chance of success. So finish quickly the, the, the sales pitch that I haven't touched on since the beginning. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes. Uh, so I think... I think maybe we'll, we'll, we'll throw in a final question to wrap up for everyone. Uh, and and kind of like what we alluded to as well in the promotion leading up to this webinar. So 
Uh, Ali, maybe I'll direct to you again to go first. Uh, but what what do you see from uh, your perspective uh, that essentially, um, you know, who are going to be the next winners in the next five to fifteen years? Like what? What are they going to be doing? What's the unique qualities and characteristics that investors should be looking for? Oh, look, it's so hard to pick a unicorn, isn't it? Unless it comes out with a shiny horn. Um, <laughs> I think it's I think it's somebody that's going to be bold enough to be a game changer, to reinvent how we think about things, but it's so spectacular that it just makes sense and that we think, why wasn't this there the whole time? Um but certainly in relation to there's some big players now. So they'll, they're going to have to either fold into those big players, they'll be able to get the data out of big players and move it into their systems if they're going to create whole systems. Um, and, you know, we've, we've gone through this period of, um, I guess, tech by choice where we pick and choose the bits that we want. I do feel like there's going to be a little sway away from that. So I think it's going to have a pretty fulsome product. Thanks, Sally. Alistair, yeah. Um, so if we look at attributes, I think the attributes are um, someone that understands the profession, like properly understands the profession. And whether that's because within the team there is an accountant or whether they're working like supremely collaboratively with accountants, like that, that and really understanding the DNA and makeup of what an accounting firm needs. I think also building for tomorrow, not today. And I, by that, I mean um, using technology of tomorrow, so like game-changing technology, but also the the operating model of an accounting firm for tomorrow, not not what's happened before. And I think, you know, so they'll be riding both those waves as well. And then it's all about data. So so how can they, how can they best leverage data um, uh, it, within their product as well for the benefit of the accountant, for the benefit of their clients? I think we've seen evolution in the past 15 years. I think we're looking for revolution now. Thanks, Alistair. Um, just because we need to be a bit quick, I'll, I'll guide a little bit. I mean, Jason, if you want to go next, then Seb and Kendra, I'll let you wrap up. No, I'm not, too much sure, not sure there's much you can add to what Ali and Alistair covered there. It was very, both very well said. I think um, in a world, again, where you know, the overly complicated things will be left behind. It really does need to be something that can be seamlessly integrated into everything that we're already using. Um, I can't see a world at the moment where there's going to be the next up and lift of everything that we're doing right now and moving it to a completely new system and a completely re new like interface. So yeah, the, the seamless integration, automating the tasks, scalable, you know, the, just the, all the little things you got to get right. And then as well, if you're talking 10, 15 years, I think it needs to be something that can be global. Um, I see a diverse, a, a, a more decentralized world where, you know, we've, we've got clients in the UK, we've got clients in New Zealand, we've got clients in the US. And now the systems that aren't talking across all different countries are becoming frustrating to use as well. So if we are talking longer term as well, we've got to be able to get away from being, you know, this Australian accounting product or this UK accounting product. So that's something else I'll add. Right. Thanks, Jason. Seb, very quickly. Yeah, I, I really appreciated that last point, by the way, of like you, you kind of have to start thinking globally. Um, I, I agree with that. On, uh, and also what Ali and Alistair mentioned, I completely agree with that. You need really core understanding of accounting. Uh, you, it's not the times anymore of like, I learned how to do a bit of PHP. Let me go and like write up a startup about this. It's like that those days are gone. Um, I would say that uh, in terms of timelines, so we're looking five to 15 years in the future. I think we're now in the early days of like frothing of like new accounting tech um, that is AI infused or maybe even built on top of AI from, from the beginning. Uh, I think this will probably die out a little bit. Uh, it's very easy today to be an engineer, maybe to have a background in, in AI or, or like ML or something and like want to have a crack at a product in, accounting, in the accounting space and build it with AI. So I think there's a lot of like point-based solutions that are coming out and it's a bit like a flurry of those that are 
cropping up. But I think if you really want to be a long-term winner, you kind of have to take the long-term approach of like really understanding what's happening in the profession. So you can bring that revolutionary mindset and you can kind of think like, okay, how can I build this from the ground up? Like, can I really understand all the processes that are going into this? So that's just my own opinion. Like uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be a lot of pen and paper and mapping out flows that go into an accounting practice and figure out how to build those from first principles. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Seb. And Kendra, I'll let you uh, basically wrap up. I'll be a maverick and say I'm not sure that it is someone who deeply understands the accounting profession because I'm not sure that in 15 years the accounting profession as we know it today will, will be as it looks today. So I think it is very interesting to look at where some of the tax jurisdictions are going and they're going to par tax at point of payment. And I think at collecting tax at point of payment could make an enormous difference and really shift a lot of the accounting workflow as we know it today to a quite different paradigm and bring a lot of really different players into the space. So what I would say is the winners will be the people who own the workflow and own the eyeballs. And we don't know yet where that workflow and those eyeballs will be. But then I would close with saying the companies that will really win in a, in a future that will be much more a synergy between humans and machines are those that know that to collect the data today, that they need to build the products for tomorrow. Right. Thanks, Kendra. I think uh, that's really the perfect place to, to finish. So uh, I'll wrap up. Uh, and again, thanks for uh, everybody that attended live. Thanks for everyone that's watching the recording. And thanks for this amazing panel. Uh, hopefully we've taken into a bit of an interesting journey. And probably everybody here is like accounting is always one of the industries that always everybody says that AI is going to automate and there's not going to be any more accountants anymore. So hopefully you got a bit more nuance and, and depth, uh, what's actually behind it, where the future uh, is going, and from, for investors, uh, what kind of opportunities uh, this could present. Uh, so thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day or night, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Yeah.